Hello friends, Joe here at Reverb. Behind me, there are five crazy weird vintage basses. Let's find out what they are, why they are, and what they sound like. <laughs> As we know, many electric basses from the 50s, 60s, and 70s have gone on to become some of the most iconic bass models of all time. And then there's these ones that uh, didn't quite catch on. And because of that, have a certain character and have retained a certain value. Let's talk about five of them, starting with the Gibson Les Paul Signature. When you hear Les Paul Signature, you might envision a custom Les Paul variant made by Gibson in collaboration with someone like Slash or Joe Walsh. For people who care about vintage Gibsons though, Les Paul Signature refers to a somewhat obscure, though undeniably awesome semi-hollow body guitar that was first produced by Gibson in the early 70s. These models were part of a string of releases that marked a reunion between Gibson and Les Paul himself in the late 1960s. Paul and Gibson had parted ways for most of the decade, and between 63 and 68, Gibson didn't really produce any guitars with his name on it. The Les Paul model as we know it came back in 1968, and the following year, Paul worked with Gibson to create a new line of guitars that used these unique low impedance pickups that Les championed for their clear, clean tones. First came the Les Paul Personal, and then the Professional and Recording, along with a Les Paul Recording Bass, later called the Triumph Bass. Finally, starting in 1973, came the most striking of all, the Les Paul Signature, a semi-hollow body with a unique, almost Fender-like offset cutaway style. Gibson made 1,500 of these guitars in the 1970s and even fewer basses. The sunbursts are more rare than the gold tops, so the sunburst bass might be the rarest of the lot. Like the guitars, the bass has this nifty three-way impedance selector switch to counter the tone a bit. This bass was re-released as the Epiphone Jack Cassidy model more recently, which is still in production, and an awesome affordable choice for anyone looking for some of that old school semi-hollow bass thump. There was also a similar Gibson model called the Midtown Signature, which is rare, but you can find it using your reverb feed. Okay, next up, the Dan Armstrong Ampeg Lucite. The origin of these distinct, clear-bodied guitars and basses comes from Ampeg's efforts to break into the guitar market. They approached Dan Armstrong in 1967 in New York. Armstrong landed on using Lucite, a specific trade name for a type of acrylic, thinking that its rigidity would help the guitar sustain well. The guitar versions of these had these peculiar swappable pickups, but the basses were fixed. There was also a fretless version later, and a few made with this see-through black plastic as well. Those are rare. The whole series was only produced for a couple of years, and most of their fame roots from Keith Richards playing one of the guitars in this period, though lots of other folks have picked them up as well. Dan Armstrong, for his part, would soon move to the UK and go on to produce a line of influential tiny boxed effects that plugged into a guitar's output jack. Do we think it'll have transparent tone? So sorry, I'm sorry. SD Curly. It is certainly not a household name. However, uh, this is a really interesting company and they started making basses in 1976. The company was founded by three partners outside Chicago, focused on building instruments that had an all-natural look, uh, efficient playability, and an affordable price. Um, look at this thing. <laughs> it kind of looks like a telephone. Like you'd pick the phone up off of here, you know? SD Curly, I got your next great idea. Apart from the distinct look of these basses and their cool DiMarzio pickups, one of the other notable things about this company is that they were one of the, if not the first American manufacturer to license their designs to Japanese makers, opting to partner with these firms rather than wait for them to make unlicensed copies, as they had done with Gibson and others. Curly ended up re-importing some of these Japanese-made models, and the one I'm sampling here today is actually one of those. 
it was built in the now legendary Matsumoku factory. In recent years, the Birdsong Company has taken up the SD Curly mantle and started to make modern versions of some of these designs. There's a really detailed article about the company and its instruments on the Birdsong website, written by Birdsong chief Scott Beckwith. You should check it out if you want to learn more. We'll include a link below. Next up, the Rickenbacker 4005. We all probably know the Rickenbacker 4001, which is one of the most well-known basses along with the jazz bass and the P bass. Its semi-hollow counterpart, the 4005, was not quite as popular, and so only a small number were made. However, it still has the mojo, for sure. These basses first came out in 1965 in a period where other companies like Gibson and Hofner were already making hollow and semi-hollow bass models. Aesthetically and functionally, this bass is the counterpart to the massively iconic Rickenbacker 360 and 36012. It's truly just sumptuous and there are so many little nifty details like this totally awesome checkerboard binding on the back of the body. Also, like other Ricks, it has a nice neck profile on its multi-part neck construction. Based on the historical listings we found on Reverb, most of these were fire glows with the maple glows like this one following that. Rickenbacker also offered some of their more adventurous finishes in this bass and at least a couple that were in their insane light show plexiglass thing. Next up, and last up, is this crazy thing, the Gretsch 6070. What am I doing? In the early to mid 1960s, many companies were experimenting with hollow body bases, including Gibson and Guild. Now Gretsch is not as well known as a, as a bass company as some of the other players of the day. However, they made some interesting bases, including this 34 inch scale uh, model 6070. This thing came out in 1962. This is the biggest neck I've ever played. <laughs> Sounds a spatula. <laughs> Over easy. This bass is a lot like the rest of the Gretsch catalog of the day, down to the Filtertron and later Supertron pickups. Also characteristically Gretsch, you have this great back pad on the back. And of course, this weird awesome kickstand, which you saw me make a fool of myself at the beginning of this segment trying to play an upright like that. But you gotta remember that in the early 60s, the bass guitar was still a relatively new concept. So lots of companies needed to do things to make it seem more approachable and familiar to upright players. The Ampeg AEB and AUB models are great examples of this too. And with Gretsch, this kickstand is a nice testament to this transitional period in the bass world. This model is also sometimes called the Country Gentleman Bass. Uh, also a really cool feature on this bass is the dampener switch here. Raises the dampener. There are five crazy, weird, vintage basses that we found on Reverb. Uh, let us know if you found any crazy, weird kinds of instruments that didn't quite catch on, and we'd love to check those ones out too. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time. Does this sound like an average Joe bass player to you? I didn't think so. I don't think that's an average Joe style. I can do this stuff too. I can switch it and do it this way. Next time you think about writing average before my name, you think about that moment right there. Next. <laughs>